Used throughout the world, Bedmax is the UK's foremost manufacturer of tailor-made horse shavings. Bedmax is a very high quality bedding made from British pine, and this bedding provides a healthy, dust-free, stable environment, combating common health and welfare issues associated with the stabled horse. Bedmax is designed to maximize cushioning for joints, minimize moisture that can damage hooves, and provides maximum comfort and support. For more information, go to bedmaxshavings.com. Welcome to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast. Welcome to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast and a When Nicole Met show very kindly supported by Bedmax. Now, the lady on today's show has been the most extraordinary influence on eventing, particularly in Great Britain. She is a Burley winner herself, so she's a five-star winner, but she worked with the British youth teams uh, in particular for around 30 years, led them to nearly 100 medals. That is quite a tally. She's been instrumental in the careers of the likes of Pippa Funnel, William Fox Pitt, Kitty King, our very own Kitty King, uh, Tina Cook, the list really does go on. She is one of only around 50 or so active fellows of the British Horse Society in the world. Welcome to the show, Jill Watson. Good morning. Uh, Jill, we are delighted to have you with us. And Kitty and I actually had a conversation um, some months ago and we were talking about the podcast and she said, you have got to talk to Jill at some point because she has been such a driving force behind so many of these top level event riders that we see throughout the years. And, and we'll talk, I'm sure, about the story and the journey throughout today. But the influence you have had on eventing over the last few years is not to be underestimated. So let's go back to the very beginning of your career. How did you get into horses to start with? When you were a young girl, did you have an immediate love for them? How did that sort of love affair with eventing start? Well, I was quite lucky. I went to a school where riding was available at the, on a Saturday morning. And so we were picked up and went to a local riding school. And I was probably 10 or under then. And I, I just fell for it, I suppose, straight away. Um, and then that continued. And I continued at a riding school, never owned a pony but still got totally hooked. So when did it become something that actually you wanted to make a career out of? Because you, you first of all, had a very successful competition career. And in later years, it has very much been a coaching career. But when did that moment come that you thought, actually, this is something that I want to do for the rest of my life or, or for the coming years? Well, I think that my parents always hoped I would go to university and, as my father would have said, have a proper job. And he unfortunately died when I was 15. So I always felt slightly obliged to follow that. Although I knew that really what I wanted to do was remain with the horses. So I, I pursued the college career and qualified as a PE teacher. But realistically, it was never really what I wanted to do forever. So um, very quickly, I returned and started to follow the equine route. Do you think though that that sort of those early years of, of learning to teach albeit as a PE teacher actually you had that passion to kind of shape the lives of, of young people and and that was something then that you put to great effect in later years when you were coaching the junior and youth teams? Definitely I think those years spent at college um, trips to the Lake District, learning to sail, learning to rock climb, which I have to say I hated, um, mm -hmm. and pothole, which I refused to do. But all those experiences, I, I think, um, yes, were of huge value. And teaching at any level, the advice you got and the experience you got in those early years, I'm sure was very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it really followed you through your career. I want to ask you about um, Pat Smallwood, who was a remarkable lady, and she's been a huge influence in your career. You were based at Radnage House. Um, and that, I guess, was the the sort of 
platform for, for the start of your career. Tell us a bit about that time and sort of how that then shaped your career later on. As you say, Pat Smallwood, who we never called anything but Miss Smallwood, and still I find it hard to say Pat Smallwood. We had such respect for her, but she she was quite strict. She helped helped us, but in quite a tough way in many ways, which was probably very good for us. I learned to ride there. I rode, I swept the yard and learned to ride by riding the ponies in and out of the fields bareback. So a lot of my early years got me totally hooked on the environment. And then I think I um, was lucky my local district commissioner of the Pony Club sent a horse to be broken in and that was my task and he proved to be Shaitan who I won Burley on. So it was a pretty amazing story really to learn in a riding school and and then eventually go go to Burley. Tell us a bit about Shaitan because he was the horse on whom you won Burley which was I think 1969 which I guess was the the, the sort of the the big win of your eventing career but what was he like as a horse and what was that Burley win like for you? Well I think he was he was an Arab cross so he probably wasn't the most likely um, event horse. He was very fast quite highly strung but I broke him in and I'm pr- I probably won Burley when he was, I think, only eight, which now we would say is far too young. But to be honest, at that time, we didn't really have to qualify like you did now. So I think when he'd done a certain amount, we thought, let's go to Burley. And off we went. So um, I had, at that time, I do remember Miss Smallwood coming into the school, seeing me training him and I was thought I was doing half fast and she asked me you know what what he what what was that and I said oh half fast she said you have a lot to learn and she went and I suppose that sort of fueled me to think oh perhaps I don't quite know what I'm doing uh, so there was a lot of help from her without actually um, doing it for me I think from there, you know, I I realized that I became very aware of what people were doing and I sought help. And I went and had some help from Lars Soderholm, who was amazing, generous with his time and the effort he put into me and very supportive when it came to Burley. So in terms of Burley then, that was the the, the big win in 1969 with Chateau. At what point did you, were you competing a lot of horses at this point or was it a smaller operation? And when did you decide, actually, I'm not going to focus so much on the competing anymore, but coaching is where my heart lies? Well, I think at that time I did have a few to ride and obviously a bit of success fed you with a few more rides. But financially, I had to really have a job and I couldn't be going around the country so I wasn't sponsored in that sort of way although I was very lucky to have some horses to ride so I did I kept riding and competing really for quite a lot of years after that but I realized that I must do something and so I then set up a yard to try and um, have horses in for training and people for training and that was at Aston Park and there were some very kind people, the Cuthbert, Bernice and Tony, who rented me boxes and I, I rented the boxes I could fill. So they were probably three pounds a box. And if I, if I filled three, I paid for three, et cetera. And that was really how I got started running a yard. And then along came Colonel Alfrey and said would I like to train the juniors so it it was all a fairly amazing success by sheer luck really so it was 1981 
I think was it that you yeah. that you took on the the junior young rider um, sort of program in terms of training the the youth teams for Team GB. At that moment, when you started training the youth teams, could you have believed that actually, if somebody had said to you in thirty years' time, you would you would still be doing it? Would you have believed that, or was it very much a "we'll do it, see how it goes, and and where that will take me next"? I I think I would not have believed it would lead me down the path it did but at the time of being asked to take it on the amazing selectors for juniors and young riders were all retired colonels who fed me information guided me and one thing led to another and success breeds success in a way and and I had amazingly talented riders in those early days. I mean, if you suddenly get William Fox Pitt and Tina on your doorstep, you know, you're very lucky. Was it apparent very early on that riders such as William, as um, Tina, Pippa Funnel as well, came through the, the youth programmes at that sort of a similar time? Was it apparent to you, having seen them, um, so early in their career that actually they were going to to make a real name for themselves at the top of the sport and even still be doing that today? I don't think you could have imagined how long they would go on being so successful, but they certainly had a quality about them um, and they had the background that helped them get being selected for these teams. So I wasn't really making these people. They came to me and I could... I bonded them as a team and hopefully then as a team we worked and won lots of medals. But it's all about the people who initially trained these people. And actually that that's not a point to be underestimated because as a as a team trainer, and particularly in sort of the earlier days, you didn't necessarily get the the level of um, access to riders that you would now. So you would have a, a sort of a couple of training days, a selection day, and then maybe a concentrated period before you go off to a championship. Um, in talking to, to Gitty before recording this show, one of the things we were, were very much focused on is actually that that's a very difficult sort of process to manage because you have... Riders who are obviously extremely talented have their own systems in place and own trainers and everything else. But something that you you managed to do to great effect was to be able to work with that. So not try and change anybody, but very much bring out the best in them in the process in which they were working. Is that almost an element of, of human psychology in there as well, Jill? Yeah, I think I think definitely bonding and making a team is a lot to do with human psychology but also I was very lucky because when I started a lot of riders who came on training courses they didn't have trainers at home they probably went and had lessons and some had very knowledgeable parents but on the whole they loved coming on courses hopefully for what they learned but also for getting together bonding with each other so it was like a club really they all got together got to know each other compared what they were doing and I think that is a way of bonding a young team and have, have certainly maintained many of those friendships through to today what were they like Jill as younger riders um, in terms of bringing out the best in them because obviously I imagine younger younger riders coming through some require quite a lot of confidence building some are perhaps you know have plenty of confidence and it's about sort of managing that in the right direction how were those riders sort of in the early days of their career well I think uh, they would like to think that they got up to a lot I didn't know about <laughs> <laughs> the main skill if it was one was to um, be aware but not let them not stop them what in what they were doing so what they got up to in the evenings and as long as they were there at seven o'clock the next morning I I hopefully turned a blind eye and as long as they delivered and we got the results 
I think in that way they had a lot of fun. And I I can remember William saying, it's got to be fun. This was after he'd done it. And we had a lot of fun. And I think that's very important with young people. Yeah, absolutely. And do you know what? It's such a it's such a turning point in young riders' lives, isn't it? Going through juniors to young riders, you're what, age 16 to 21. And actually, this is shaping your entire career. And I think probably the reason that we've seen so many of these riders go on to, to so much success in the future is that those experiences were so enjoyable that it actually left such an impact on them. And they thought, you know what, I want to do this again. I want to do this again. And they the, the love and the sort of, I can't really call it an, an addiction, but it is as such that desire to have that feeling of a championship sort of sticks with them and and kind of actually that is the turning point and the moment in which they they say no this is what I want to pursue in life um what about sort of managing the people around the squads because you know junior young riders come with with a support team of their own parents and you know supporters who want to to play a part and have a very valid part to play in that journey. Was managing the team of of the support crew as much a part of the journey as managing the riders themselves? Yes, I I suppose it was, but also the selectors and the colonels, they were very good at dealing. When I first started, they really dealt with the parent side. I just dealt with the riders. And then I sort of learnt a bit better how to deal with the parents and I think at the beginning I wanted to push them away and say you know this is my job move off but I learned that actually they play an important role and I I tried to involve them without letting them take command of me so I, I wanted to feel I still had control of the situation but involved them a little bit as well yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's a, a key point of sort of managing those relationships. And, you know, the the role of coach, of mentor, of trainer, uh, particularly in the junior youth teams is not to be underestimated because it is such a such a curve point of, of everybody's lives growing up and shaping their careers going forward. Uh, let me ask you about the sort of the bigger picture as such, because one of the things that you have been really passionate about, and, and it will bring us on to some of your work today, is very much not just the, you know, improving your flying changes or how to sit better to the trot, to, to put it very, very simply. You know, it's not components of particular riding. It is very much the bigger picture and how you can go to a top level event and deliver and manage your horse and your experience and everything about the competition throughout. So tell us a bit about that, because that's been something that you've really been passionate about throughout your career. Yes, I think it's it's really important for these riders that they learn all the skills involved in competing. It's not just about winning medals, it's about horsemanship. And, and sometimes that, you know, is the key to their success and nowadays there's a lot more help in nutrition and sports psychology and all those but to begin with I think that was a little bit something I was very keen to get across that they the horse came first they looked after their horses well they behaved well within their riding career so to speak and then had free time as well and how has that led? So you made the decision back in oh, 2011, uh, 30 years, nearly 100 medals. I think there were nearly 40 gold medals over that time frame, which is just absolutely incredible. How did you make the, the transition then from stepping away from the juniors and the young riders and then actually sort of delivering on that passion to help other riders in the future be able to access that kind of help and support? I, I do think initially I found it quite difficult because uh, it was a way of life to me, training the teams and the involvement. It, it, you know, it took 100% of my time, really. So when suddenly that wasn't my responsibility, it felt very strange. But the junior, ex-juniors young riders, 
were still there. They were still good friends of mine. And a lot of them were a little bit in the middle of nowhere because there wasn't much guidance for them to move on. And they weren't probably ready to move up to senior level. So that's when I really decided they were the people I wanted to help now, the people who were just out of the juniors and young riders age group, or at least the, the support given to that age group. So from from stopping the, the junior young riders, and I imagine it was a serious lifestyle change, the the next step was to to do something to kind of help support those riders, which actually led to the introduction of the Bridging the Gap scholarship, which I know we've mentioned on this show many a time, and um, we've had plenty of, of past winners, the likes of Frankie Reed Warlow, Tim Cheffings, uh, have all come through that program. Um, how was that born and how did it develop? Because it, it's really, really grown. And in the last probably eight, eight, nine years, I would say, it, it's had a huge impact on the sport as well. Uh, yes, I'd like to think it has. I think it has grown. Initially, I started to run courses off my own back for that level. And then it, it was very popular. And I involved Little Winter to help me do this. And she at the time was working for BE. So then she suggested to BE, they found a sponsor for it. And we were very fortunate that Mark Todd took on uh, the role as the sort of key leader of it so that Mark said he would give a scholarship to one person every year for the someone we would select who had attended Bridging the Gap sessions. So we went through a series of selecting people who'd attended training and then we picked a scholar and then Mark would sort of mentor them for a year and that was a huge opportunity for some of these riders. It it wasn't always used maybe as well as it could be because one problem with riders at that stage is they, they're they trying to make a career, they're trying to run a yard probably, they can't be away very much. And so for some, they couldn't probably make as good a use of Mark's offer as they would have liked to, but certainly they gained a lot if they were a scholar and they were very lucky and it's still running now isn't it so the bridging the gap scholarship is still running and um the support of people like yourself is still very much available to anybody kind of bridging that gap as the name might suggest up to the sort of the three star the four star the five star level so what's in store for the next few months the slight um difficulty is that Bridge eventing no longer support training apart from the teams. So it, it, the dates no longer appear on their website, which was a very good way of people finding out what was going on. So now we are trying to spread the word that Bridging the Gap still exists. We're very lucky that Keyflow have taken on supporting the series. So um that is where we are at the moment. We're trying to get it out, to publicise it, so that people know Bridging the Gap is still happening and this is how you apply. And at the moment, it's on the Keyflow website. We, certainly myself, I'm not very good at advertising these things. Um, social media isn't my uh, strong point. And... I think we a lot of people don't know it's happening at the moment. There you go, listeners. If you think that that might be something that you're interested in, or if you know somebody that might actually be able to take advantage of that um, and would like access, I mean, the, the opportunity to access this level of knowledge is just absolutely incredible. And I'm, I have no doubt that it, it has really, really helped so many people and, and we'll continue to do so again. So go and have a look, Keyflow website. We'll try and post the the dates on the eventing podcast Instagram stories as well. When, when this show goes out, we'll pop them up there so they're easy to find. Um, Jill, looking back at, at your career and sort of, I mean, asking you to pick highlights 
is probably a tough one, but I'll, I'll come on to anything that sticks out for you. I wanted to ask you about um, Rio 2016, because that was a fairly instrumental moment in so much as every single person that was competing in Rio uh, for Team GB. So there was uh, William Fox Pitt, uh, Kitty King, Gemma Tattersall. I'm trying desperately to think of the fourth person. Tina. Tina was there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, um, and Pippa. Yeah, um, Pippa. Pippa. Pippa Funnel. Yeah. There we go. Um, but yeah. every single person, including the performance director, Dan Hughes, had yeah. come through your sort of junior young rider program at some point in time. Did that give you an immense amount of pleasure to obviously follow the careers of some of the riders that you have trained at the younger age groups? Oh, huge pleasure, um, especially when I thought of having Dan and William, Tina and Pippa. It, when I was very new to it and we went to Axel Swang with a young rider team, and they all threw each other in the lake and went boating and were pretty wild. And I thought, well, you know, it didn't do them any harm. Look where they've got to now. So, again, I go back to all the fun they had and, and the medals they won. Hopefully put them on the ladder to that success in Rio. It absolutely did. And those four were on a team. I think it was 1989, that Young Rider Championship. But those four of William... Um, Fox Pip, Pippa Funnel, Tina Cook and Dan Hughes, who was that performance director in Rio, were all on a Young Rider team together uh, under Jill back in 89. Um, Jill, if there's any sort of standout memories or individual performances, what sort of be the moments that you are most proud of? You know, I think every time, every championship, every success was good. And, you know, even the championships we went to and things didn't happen there was still a good team spirit and they probably learnt just as much or even more and we worked even harder after it and I think one thing that's really highlighted that for me is that in our first lockdown I set up a young rider and junior WhatsApp chat and after quite a short time there were 150 people on it they all chatted with each other, left messages for each other, and they tended to go in slight eras of, you know, when they were competing with each other. And it was quite amazing, all of them, how much, how many friends they'd made and how much they'd enjoyed their time in teams. So, funnily enough, the the people who contributed most to that were probably the older ones. And going back, and I, I'm not saying old, but people like Maureen Piggott was one of our early young riders, and she, her memories, and she wrote that most of her friends now came from those days. So, you know, they're lovely moments. I think that's a really important thing that, you know, the, and it's something for us all to remember, the fun, the enjoyment, ultimately that helps breed the success. Because if you're hating it, if you're not enjoying it, your heart isn't in it. And therefore, you're not going to go on and, and have the success throughout there. And we can all apply that to our daily lives. I think actually do, you know, follow your heart, have fun, enjoy life and and the success will follow. Were there any venues or particularly um, events that you love to go to that always hold that sort of moment of uh, the thrill and anticipation of getting to take a team to a championship there? Yes, I think probably Platoni has to be one of my favourites because I went there quite a few times, both with, with either juniors or young riders, but I don't know if it was the weather, the atmosphere, or even the, the amusement of the ladies in the woods around the event. But um, The amusements yeah. of the ladies in the woods? Yes. That, what, what did they do? Oh, well, you obviously haven't been to Protoni. I haven't, no. No, well, in the woods, there's a lot of ladies sitting in laybys. Oh, um, oh. Att attracting whoever. 
Okay, okay, understood. Right, okay, fair enough. Not what you would expect to see as a, a championship and not ideal for a junior young rider great, championship at all. Great amusement to all our riders. I can imagine, I can imagine. Were there, were there any moments that the the teams did something that you, I mean, obviously you were very good. You said they probably thought you didn't know what was going on, but actually you knew everything that was going on. Are there any moments that you look back on now and you sort of can say to them, well, you thought I didn't know, but actually I knew full well what was happening that could be shared on this podcast. I'm not, you know. We well, don't I, think, I think there were fair a fair number of outings in the evenings which weren't meant to happen I could say but um, on the whole as long as they delivered I, I don't think I will tell them what I knew. <laughs> it's probably better it's probably better that way. Um, what about how the sport has changed Jill because obviously your your career and your involvement has bridged a, an entire sort of 40 plus years of of eventing and it's changed enormously over that time from you know the carrying weight back in the, the sort of the 80s and I think into the 90s the exclusion of roads and tracks and steeplechase in the early 2000s all the way through to the kind of the safety implements that are in the sport today it's changed enormously what's your take on that what do you like about the sport today what do you miss on the sport of when you first got involved if there is anything well, I, I agree. It's changed hugely. I think what I, um, the big change was from the long with the roads and tracks and the steeplechase. And at the time of doing it and training for it, I, I did love that side of it. But I have to say, I, I somehow now think the sport is not worse off without that. The roads and tracks was always very valuable as a warming up and everything the steeplechase certainly at junior level was a fairly risky experience because <laughs> um going fast wasn't difficult but going fast in in control was almost <laughs> impossible so there were it was quite scary but at the top level obviously it was also a huge skill the other thing about with juniors when i did it a lot of them were on horses which couldn't really gallop very well. So to have to gallop around a steeplechase and then go cross country was quite demanding. Whereas nowadays the short format, I think, it is still demanding in fitness, but in a slightly different way. So I am quite happy with the sport now as it is without the steeplechase. And how it's, yeah, and how it's changed over the years. Um, is there anything you'd love to go back and do again? Oh, start it all again and do it better. <laughs> what would you uh, change? What would you change? I mean, we could always go back and say, oh, we would do this differently. Is there anything that you think, oh, I would love to have already known this at this point in my career? I think probably, certainly in my riding career, if I think what I knew when I won Burley, it was really very little um, compared with hopefully what I know now. And I think in training people, I still find I learn things as I go along. And I think, goodness, how did I manage when I didn't know that? So I think as long as you keep learning as a trainer, then you can keep upping your game to keep up with everyone. I think we can all never stop learning. The one thing that I will really take from this show is very much, you know, you've got to have the enjoyment, you've got to have the fun side of things. And yes, take it seriously, but don't lose sight of that part of it as well. If there is anything from a, a training perspective, Jill, that you could sort of pass on to any of our listeners, you know, whatever level they're competing at, wherever in the world they are, to kind of say, do you know what, this is, in my opinion, really important and something that I think should never be sort of um, missed or you could work on or particularly favourite exercises. Is there anything that you can share that our listeners can go away and, and have a look at themselves? Yeah, I think very definitely, I think the basics are the most important thing in training. So it isn't really how to teach them to do a half pass or flying changes. It's how to how to train their horses correctly from the word go and if they have 
got the basics right, it's like learning our ABC, if you like, then everything becomes so much easier. And fast tracking is not a good idea. And I'm sure we've all gone through the fast tracking bit. Um, when I when I was at the riding school and doing pony club events, I used to try and tie bits of string from the bit to the girth because I didn't really understand what on the bit was. So nowadays, education is so much better at a very young age. And I think the basics for me is what we have to keep putting over. I think that's a really, really good point and something um, that anybody, no matter what level you are competing at, whether it's all the way up to, to five star level, whether you, you ride in your local riding school, anything, it is worth bearing in mind. Uh, Jill, thank you so much. It has been absolutely fascinating to look back on. You're so modest because your your career has been absolutely extraordinary and the impact that it has had has cannot be underestimated because it has really shaped the, the careers and the lives of top level event riders that we all enjoy watching and, and supporting today. So thank you. No, pleasure. They're, they're all my big family. They are. And I have no doubt that they would say, and I know I've heard many of them say so many kind uh, things about you and sort of how inspirational you've been to them over the years as well. Listeners, we hope you've enjoyed this really special insight, Jill Watson, with Nicole on When Nicole Met, very kindly supported by Bedmax once again. We will be back with more very soon, but stay tuned because, of course, we have got so much coming up for you over the next few weeks with the big Tokyo Olympic Games. Jill, can I put you on the spot and say, I mean, I, I'm pretty certain that you run red, white and blue for Team GB all the way. Am I right in saying that you would be putting them up for the team medal in Tokyo? Definitely. I thought as much. Look, we have got so much coming for you. Stay with us on the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast. But a big thank you to Jill and a big thank you to you guys for listening. Thank you for listening to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast. This podcast is available for free on iTunes, Spotify, Podcast Addict, or wherever you usually listen to your podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. Fancy picking your own Olympic team? Well, now is your chance as eventing manager heads to Tokyo. Compete against your friends and for your country as you tackle the fantasy football styled eventing manager game. Your $10 million budget sounds big, but you'll need to spend it wisely. Or if you prefer, you can let the computer do it for you. Join in and play against eventing fans all over the world. Follow at Echo Ratings across social media to be notified as soon as the market is open and download the app for free now in the App Store or on Google Play to make sure that you can get involved. Can you be crowned Eventing Manager Champion of Tokyo? You'll have to play along to find out.